Our first speaker of uh, the second session is Nate Sutton from Giorgio Ascoli Laboratory, or should I say Center or Institute. And uh, the talk is entitled Spiking Neural Networks and uh, Hippocampal Function, a web accessible survey of simulations, modeling methods, and underlying theories. Please, Nate, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, just to mention again, my name is Nate Sun, and I am a doctoral candidate in the bioengineering department at George Mason University. And I will be presenting today about a project and article, um, as Dr. Sebsonovich mentioned, uh, spiking neural networks and hippocampal function, a web accessible survey of simulations, modeling methods, and underlying theories. And this was work that I did with my research advisor, uh, Dr. Giorgio Ascoli. There are links on the bottom of the slide to the website and article uh, associated with the work. And these links will be included in later slides as well. So the overall goal of the work on this project is to provide research resources for the study of hippocampal cognitive functions with computational methods. And some of the image here include in the top image in the center in green, it shows a rodent hippocampus. And in the bottom images, we have the topics of computational simulations and neural networks, and these are topics which are common amongst the, the project's work. And the work on this project includes a literature view and also a knowledge base on spiking circuit and network level simulations of the hippocampal formation. The first part of the presentation will be on the literature review. The second part will be on the methods used to create the knowledge base. And the name of the knowledge base is Cognome. And the third part of the presentation will be on results from, from annotations on the knowledge base site. And I'll go over some content from articles in the literature review. There is a functional cell named grid cells. And this is a cell that's relevant to spatial memory. And when I'm describing a functional cell, I'm describing a cell that's classified by the cognitive function that it serves. And these grid cells map spatial environments with the use of firing and grid-like arrangements. And shown an image here is simulated grid cells uh, firing activity shown in the grid-like arrangements. And grid cells have been most often found in the subregion medial and trial cortex in the second layer. And grid cells can be a neuron type called stellate cells. There was a study which used in vitro methods and found that in medial and trial cortex layer two, stellate cells influence each other with cells called interneurons, and some of those stellate cells could be grid cells. And for computational modeling of grid cells, a popular class of model which is used is called continuous attractor networks. Now to discuss a different kind of function, uh, one activity that contributes to long-term memory is called shortwave ripples. The name is from short periods of strongly enhanced activity, which are sharp wave and ripples that are highly synchronized spiking. And that activity has been found in hippocampal subregions, such as the cornu ammonius area one, which is abbreviated CA1 and CA3. And sharp wave ripples have been thought to be critical to consolidation and formation of episodic memories. For example, sharp wave ripples have been observed during memory replays happening during memory consolidation. And in the image here, 
we can see sharp wave ripples that were found in neural activity of local field potentials recorded in the CA1. There was a theory and computational model that proposed a mechanism for neural physiology that helps to create sharp wave ripples. And the theory is based on experimentalist work that certain spiking in dendrites causes nonlinear signal computations in the dendrites that amplifies the synchronous neural input. And also another cognitive function, uh, pattern separation and completion, has been identified as relying on hippocampus in important ways. The sparse firing of neurons in the subregion dentate gyrus has been thought to aid pattern separation by reducing interference between patterns. Computational modeling has tested that theory have found that dentite gyrus granule cells affect pattern separation by affecting the sparsity of firing activities. And the image shown here is from the article with that modeling work. And it shows patterns are encoded in a way that separates the neural activities that represent them. And the theory in the work predicted specifically that dendrites contribute to pattern separation by affecting the sparsity of fire. And computational modeling in the work tested the theory that found support for granule cells in the dentite gyrus affecting pattern separation by inhibitory signaling. And there was evidence supporting that theory that was found through direct and indirect cell communications that were observed. And I'll go into more detail about the design of the literature view and the knowledge base. Now, the knowledge base is intended to be an online dynamic extension of the literature view. And some more annotation details are that some research properties annotated are called dimensions. And the dimensions, which were consistently annotated, were subjects, levels of detail, simulation scale, theories, anatomical subregions, and neuron types. And in the image here, we can see different subregions of the hippocampus. And not only were dimensions annotated, but also evidence was annotated for them. And that evidence provides some reasons for why annotation choices were made for the dimensions. And there's also a dimension called keywords, but that dimension was not annotated consistently, but it was because it was considered a non-essential dimension to consistently annotate. And there were literature database queries that were used to collect articles for the knowledge base. And the queries were designed to avoid bias in which articles were collected. And the way that we designed to do that was by balancing the assortment of keywords used in the queries and categories of interest. There was optimization software created to help ensure the effectiveness of article collection matching the topic of the knowledge base. And the software shuffled combinations of keywords while retaining the balance that's intended for them. And the articles retrieved were compared to example articles, which were manually collected and considered uh, to be able to be relevant to the topic of the knowledge base. The scoring of the software was done by semi-automatic matching of titles to the 200 manually retrieved example articles. And the semi-automatic Scoring works in a way that automatic title matching was done with the example articles. And then for the highest scoring matches, a manual review of the titles was done to ensure high quality. And for the articles, which were included in the knowledge base, there was multiple different types of inclusion criteria for them. And one of those 
criteria was that they must con the simulations and the articles must contain spiking neurons with circuit or network level scale simulation. And shown here in the image is the first page of the site that users come to when they visit the knowledge base. And there was another criteria which was required of the articles was that the simulation must have a minimum of at least 10 neurons in scale. And those neurons must include individual spike time modeling. And another inclusion criteria was that a minimum citations per year for articles was set to ensure that we include articles in the knowledge base that have some of the highest impacts on the scientific community. And uh, there's also additional criteria which were specified and can be reviewed uh, if you go to the help page of the knowledge base site. And there was also annotation software which was built to retrieve abstracts for doing annotations. And all of the software which was worked on in the project has been released currently as open source. And annotation results were produced from methods which were described earlier for creating annotations. And in the core collection of articles, which is the collection that statistics were reported on uh, for the annotations in the article, there were 105 articles included in that collection. And we can see an image here of the SAT, site stats page of the knowledge base. And the optimization software ran 100,000 different query keyword variations and did 200 million title uh, matches to example articles. And it took one week of computational time to process these uh, tasks. And the final queries, which were selected from the software, had a 70% match to the example articles which were provided and contained approximately 4,500 unique article titles. And the specific queries that were chosen to be used uh, are available on the help page of the knowledge base site. And based on these uh, final queries and the articles retrieved from them, there was a threshold set for citations per year of 10, which was chosen to balance the literature collection size with the time needed to do annotations. And the knowledge base site has multiple different pages available for users. Uh, one of those pages is the main page which is the first page and allows users a quick and straightforward way to do searching of the literature uh, to get started with the site. There's also additional search pages which offer more search options like the advanced search page. And there's also a custom search page which users can choose from a predefined list of keywords or create any keyword that they want for doing uh, full text searching of articles on the site. And in the image here, we can see the advanced search page. Other pages on the site are the browse articles page, the health and details page, and the site status page. There's also an extended collection of articles available, which adds more than 300 additional articles to the core collection. And that extended collection is not restricted by the inclusion criteria for the core collection. And the extended collection articles are all still relevant to the knowledge base topic. <laughs> and in terms of literature review statistics reporting, there are several different statistics which were reported on. The image shows subjects uh, annotated and the counts of those subjects. In the image, we can see the most common subjects that were annotated were spatial navigation, episodic memory, and other forms of learning and memory. Neurological disorders were the next most common subject. Regarding other dimensions, uh, most common neuron model found was the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron model. Most common subregions were the CA3, CA1, and the entorhinal cortex.
Most common simulation scales were less than 500 neurons and between 999 and 100,000 neurons. Excuse me, Nate, you have five minutes left. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm wrapping up right okay. now. Okay. But thank you. Um, most common theories found were the attractor dynamics and the theta phase precession and the frequency that the theories were found in simulations. Uh, indicates in part the animal studies supporting uh, evidence for those theories. Most common neuron types found were the pyramidal basket and stellate cells and motivation for computational modelers including detailed neuron types to enhancing, enhancing the authenticity of models. I'd like to thank my graduate committee and lab members that helped me with doing the work. I've listed names here and I'll open things up. Does anybody have comments or questions? Yes, please. Well, I, I have a question, Ben, but... Sorry, it's too loud. Too loud? No, it's too, <laughs> too silent. No, we cannot hear you. Uh, maybe I can ask meanwhile. What technical tools do you use to expand the project? Did you consider, for example, using VR uh, to represent neuronal morphologies? Uh, your, your voice was breaking up somewhat. Okay. Which tool? Virtual reality helmet. To, the the to, virtual reality helmet. Um, to yeah, to look at some of the um, the ideas which are present. Look at the morphologies of neurons. Yeah, I think that that could be really useful way to be able to take a you know in depth look at a lot of structures and properties of that. Um, I know that currently uh, we do provide like high resolution or good images of the morphologies, but I think that could be a very interesting way. You probably need to um, kind of extract a, a three-dimensional structure, which I think, that, you know, maybe uh, from some equipment able to be extracted. Um, and I think that that could be a very interesting direction and useful. Um, I'll, I'll mention that to, to my research advisor. Well, I, I guess he is now listening to us. I see his name. Yeah, I mean, yes. Hi, Giorgio. Um, uh, hello, Alexi. Hello, Nate. Great, great talk. Um, so there is a group in, um, in China, in Nanjing, uh, that pioneered the use of uh, immersive um, technology and virtual reality helmets to uh, not only visualize, but actually trace the neurons, oh. especially the long projection neurons that now there are technologies to um, uh, label across the whole brain. So these are long projection axons that might traverse the entire brain. And um, you can basically literally walk around the brain um, physically in the room while wearing these uh, virtual reality devices. And with your hand, uh, trace the axons uh, as it traverses versus, you know, prefrontal cortex and other areas and so forth. So I tried it uh, when I was visiting Nanjing a couple of years ago. I got a little bit of nausea, but then you get used to it. And it's uh, definitely very effective uh, to doing so. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's, not, it's not for every lab because it, it takes some, you know, heavy software, uh, graphic cards, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's definitely a way to go for very complex structures. Well, I have this technology in my lab. I mean, virtual reality. So... Yeah, this is why I'm asking. Uh, well, maybe not tracing, but uh, just investigating the structure would be useful. I don't know. Um, uh, I'll send you the links to what I know, and maybe you can try that software and uh, look at neurons. We don't have virtual reality in our lab, but other labs here at Masons do. So we have not we have not tried it ourselves yet. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Ricardo? 
can I can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I was wondering uh, how you uh, going to extend the the database of articles that you have in your in your system. If you have some procedure for introducing new articles are, are, as they are appearing, or how how it's going to 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 work. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we try to create a um, web-based tool for adding articles, which actually automatically extracts details from PubMed um, with their API. And then we manually enter some uh, other specific details like dimension annotations. So we do have a pretty user-friendly tool for adding articles, um, but the future direction we're looking into is being able to create um, general public user suggested submissions to the knowledge base. It will require some more engineering of the software to be able to um, you know, store all of the user suggestions and things. But right now we do have uh, an internal lab tool for adding articles, um, which is pretty efficient way to add them. But we would be interested potentially in making it uh, available to just the general public in the future. Good oh, point. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess you. we need to move to the next talk now. Thank you very much. So can you stop sharing your screen? Okay. Thank you. Our next